came here actually, I, my, my, my son been feeling feverish and I decided to bring him to the hospital yesterday. When I brought him to the, uh, the hospital, the hospital rejected him on grounds that never had enough bedding. We went in, we went, they, they told her to come this morning. Since I brought my son here this morning at about 6.15, up to present he died in the car. Nobody have touched him. Yeah, in the line now in the car. People die in the numbers here. People die in the numbers. As you look here now, look at the number of bodies lying down. Look how desperate, look how dangerous it is for a boy who, who I, I know to be to, 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 to be a very strong boy, die for no reason. Up to now he have not been tested. Uh, yeah, for sure. At the moment, we're completely over capacity, and as a result, we're having to turn people away. It's not something a humanitarian organisation takes lightly, and we want to provide care to everyone who can, who needs it. Um, so naturally, we're feeling, uh, we're completely and utterly overwhelmed. There are no other words for it. Um, yeah. My name is Jay Sucker Moses. I'm a Liberian medical doctor. We have a cereals, we have a dial situation here. Our unit was constructed with a 35 bed space, but our current census is at 67 patients on the ward. What that means is that our bed spaces are filled, so we put mattresses on the floor. We have put so many mattresses on the floor that we do not even have corridors to walk because we cannot turn patients away because to turn a patient away would be to send patients away to infect their families and then we could have more deaths. The thing that we are seeing here is that patients that have been brought here, there's no care, no food, no water, no medication. My auntie and her late son were brought here at the center here. The patients that are brought here, they are not cared for. Getting it? There's no separation between the patients that they keep here so that it can be transferred to the proper center for treatment. And there is no distinction to tell which one is suffering from cholera, which one is suffering from malaria, which one coming down with Ebola. Now they are all mixed together. Where am I? I'm Colonel Glenn, J.K. Yambe. Things are fine for now. The people are moving around, you know, and they're going about their normal business. The only thing here is that the doors have not been opened to the public for them to go out. Sometimes people try to go out and we we'll bring them back in. But so far I've not heard of any escapees. And you came, they say you're having Ebola, they do your test, you were having Ebola. And now they do your test more than three times, right? And you don't have it. I'm grateful to God to see myself sitting in the yard today. Other people were thinking the world will left. No more, no more ever come back. <laughs> well, thank you to Ashoka Mukpo for that footage. Um, and welcome to this panel on covering health crisis and also what you should cover when covering health crisis. Uh, we have a quite strong panel, uh, two countries, or three countries actually, uh, and I'll introduce them as they are about to speak. Um, it probably started in Guinea in December 2013. Uh, by March 2014, it has reached Sierra Leone and Liberia. By June, same year, it reached the capital, Monrovia. We saw some footage from there. Um, and by August, it also reached Nigeria. Uh, we're gonna start just taking a recap of the situation in Liberia uh, last summer. Um, and we are very pleased to have the editor of Front Page Magazine from Liberia, Rodney Siyu. 
Uh, so if you could just tell us a little bit how you and your staff covered Ebola and how sort of the whole covering came about. Well, um, when it first started, there was a lot of um, doubts. There were a lot of um, uncertainty about whether it was going to even come to our doorsteps because Guinea was reporting deaths and we heard some cases in Sierra Leone and there was no way of, you know, knowing whether it's going to come next. So the challenge was how do you cover an epidemic when you haven't seen what it looks like? So our reporters were very, we didn't have any protection. There were no, at the time there were no PPEs available, there were no gloves, there were no way to protect yourself. So we were just exercising caution and telling them don't go too close to a patient. Um, if you have a long microphone, you stand far if you're talking to someone who's suspected. Um, even as a doctor, you have to be very cautious how you talk to them. So it was very challenging. And people were not believing that there was Ebola because they felt it was you know, a made up thing. One government official even said the epidemic was a made up thing for the government to eat money. And that made a lot of headlines about, and even created more curiosity about whether this disease actually existed. So it was not until late, early, maybe early, early July, late July, early July sometime, we approached one of the ministers and said, look, we're hearing that people are dying from this disease and no one knows you know, what's happening. I think we need to show images of people dying for them to see that this is actually happening. So we were allowed to accompany one of the burial teams at the time to one of the first burials of Ebola patients. And we took pictures of the burial with the doctor, medical people in the suits. And that was the first time that people actually saw the images of dead people on the front page of a newspaper. And so right after that, we had a situation where, because there were no ambulances, our reporters had to get into taxis where reports were flying over the place that when you're in a taxi cab, someone with Ebola can just start vomiting blood and it can infect you, you can, the blood splashes on you, any part of your body can become infected. So they were taking a risk because there's no transportation. Um, we have one or two vehicles that you know, took people around, but still, those who live far off had to take taxi, public transportation to get to the different places where they were taking pictures and doing the stories. So it was very challenging trying to get the story out when there's not enough um, you, tools to work with. Um, because we started giving out chlorine and um, hand wash and things for people to put in their pockets and when they go on the field. And it's difficult telling a story and you can be wearing gloves or wearing a suit interviewing people in a village or a town where Ebola was rampant. So I did an interview with NPR Radio in America and I explain some of the challenges we're having. And a professor at Berkeley sent us uh, two bags of PPEs for our reporters. <laughs> we never got to use any of them because it was really hot to put that suit on. And we tried doing it a couple of times, but it didn't work. And it looked offensive to someone you're telling a story to, to try to wear a suit and try to put a microphone to them and ask them questions. So it was a very difficult thing to do. So we had no alternative but to just tell the story from a distance. For me, it's a burial thing going on. We were instructed not to go too close to the burial scene, not to, not to touch anything. Um, we had to, had to use a zoom camera from afar to take pictures. Um, if you had to do audio, you have to put a microphone to a long stick and stand far. So it was very, very challenging, you know, trying to get the story out. And in the process, of all this denial, of all this you know, uncertainty, 
Um, there was no way of telling whether, you know, what could happen next. And the government itself was not prepared for, for anything. And we were not prepared for anything. So we were just getting by. And in the process of doing that, when you don't have any ambulances to work with, you don't have any medical, enough medical doctors. The nurses were dying like flies, you know, like, so there was no mm -hmm. way of really um, getting information. Sometimes you have to disguise yourself to go to medical facility because the government had put in a, a ban on journalists going to medical centers. So most times you had to ask someone who you knew in the, in the government to get you access to some places because it was difficult. And we had a lot of international journalists coming through to work with us. And it made things a little easier because when they see a foreign journalist, they get them more access to places. And it worked for a while and because the message was getting out that people were dying. And there were, you saw the images of people lying in front of clinics and hospitals. There were not enough rooms. There were not enough um, places. The first cases of Ebola that went outside happened because um, the one that went to Nigeria and lived in America uh, it happened someone had a pregnant uh, sister or a relative, put them in a taxi, drive them around for a few places, can't find any space in the medical place. In the medical place. As a result, they ended up, you know, either touching that person or, because in Liberia, there's not, the public transportation is very scarce, you know. It's, you have motorbikes, they call pen pen, which is you, have two or three persons on the bike riding and they have to hold from the back, you know. So it was, how do you prevent the disease that in a country where poverty is so high and there's no way of getting around? So it was a very, very complicated thing to avoid. Um, there was a situation one time where when I reported was on a bus and his bus, like, um, this person on the bus started vomiting blood and the driver just swerved the car in the middle of of the, what the president's office is, and everybody just started running, jumping out of the windows of the car because they didn't want to get infected. So those things happen everywhere, and it was like panic everywhere. People were, you know, running helter skelter. And when you put your television on in a hotel or where your friends were visiting, and you see the international media covering it, you think it was a hell zone. I mean, it was, but it wasn't that, you know, bad as it was being portrayed, but it was in the sense that things were happening because there was no ambulances, there were no f medical f facilities, there were no doctors to take care of people. Doctors were dying because they, they themselves, like us, they didn't know how to handle it. So someone comes into a hospital and says they're sick, you're innocent, you just touch them. Without gloves, you become infected, and that's how people are dying. So in the absence of all of these medical supplies, it became difficult to cover a crisis that was getting out of control. Rodney, just to, to, to get in with a question here, um, you did have some, some additional challenges as well, because right. um, like you said in the beginning, nobody thought it was real, somebody right. thought it was a ploy by right. the government to right. get more aid money. Right. Um, how did you sort of check sort of the facts? How did you dispel the rumors, because mm -hmm. there, there must have been a lot of rumors and misinformation. Yeah. yeah, one of the ways we did it was first to get them to let us take pictures of the dead. Mm -hmm. That wasn't happening. So once the images started coming out, people started saying, wait a minute, there must be something going on here. And most times, like, I think the real um, impact came when the first case got out of Liberia. Um, Patrick Sawyer was a guy who worked for the government he was a government consultant. He was also, um, he also worked for ArcelorMittal, which is a mining company in Liberia. And so he, his sister was sick. He, he, she thought it, he thought it was a miscarriage. So he took her to the hospital in his arms, bleeding. She was bleeding his blood, her blood all over him and went to the hospital, a Catholic hospital and said, you know, treat her doctors, nurses were keen to help him because at the time nobody knew what was happening, the devil was miscarriage. So when that happened, we heard rumors that, oh, this 
guy's sister had died. It was rumors around that he, she had died from Ebola. At that time, the people were still not sure, you know, if it was real. It was real. But when he got infected, news started coming around that he was infected because Arcelor where he was a consultant also, put out a bulletin that he had, his sister had died from Ebola and that he should stay away from the, from the premises of the, of, of the office. And so there was a lot of um, nervousness going on. People were saying, wait a minute, if this guy can get it, he was a, he was a high profile guy. He was, well, I think, the first high profile guy who died from Ebola in Liberia. So if he can die, if he can get Ebola, then something's happening. And then he got on a plane and went to Nigeria, and that's when all hell broke loose. <laughs> the airlines started panicking, they started shutting down the flights. And to get to our next door neighbor, Ghana, which is about usually one hour, 30 minutes flight, he had to go through Morocco, which is like five or six hours, and then take a flight to go back to Ghana, because there was no flight coming in. Delta had canceled, Essen, Brussels, I think. They were still doing it, but they were canceling, things were canceling. So was, there was no African airlines coming to Liberia, so everything was shut off. So it was difficult, you know, getting people to understand this is real. And when he, when he went to Nigeria and died, and that's when people said, wait a minute, this is serious. And then everybody started panicking. Because he was a guy who, on Saturday mornings, he would go in the stadium with regular folks and just jog around the field for exercise. So people got in touch with him every time. So it was like him seeing someone like that every day and her he died from Ebola, people started taking notice. And yeah. so to dispel this kind of rumors, it was like difficult to not dispel it because you something you could see, something who was, that was visible. Although there were doubts in the beginning that he may not have had Ebola, but the circumstances around his sister's death led people to believe that this was real. How was the government uh, reacting to this? Were oh, they, they forthcoming with information, or you in mentioned the, that they didn't want to let you into hospitals? In the beginning, yeah. they were really stingy, and they kind of like used the media inappropriately because they want to get the information out that this thing was real. Because at that time, international folks were not sending people in to help. So we did an editorial saying, SOS, um, come and help us before we all die in Liberia. And then the president, I remember, called me. I was in Ghana at the time, she called me and said, why do you hate your country so much? I said, what do you mean? She said, um, you did an editorial saying that the government cannot handle the situation. I said, so far we've had people dying. If your government could handle it, we would have not had this problem. So I think um, it's not fair to attack the media for writing an editorial saying, come and help us before we all die. So the funny thing is, a few weeks later, she was, um, when things got really hot, people were really dying, she wrote a letter to Obama asking for help. <laughs> and if you look at her letter she wrote to Obama and the editorial that we wrote said pretty much the same thing. It just tells you that the government in itself had no means of understanding what this thing was. They didn't plan for it. They didn't know how to handle it. Um, and so it just became a way where they were desperate. As a result, they... And if, when it helps start coming slowly, then it's to put a ban and saying, no media press, you go to any medical places. They start signing all these laws that you can't be seen in the medical place with the patient and all that crap. They didn't say that before when people were dying, but now they had the help coming with the money coming in. They said, oh no, don't stay away from these places because you know, things are gonna get sour. So it was really, really um, difficult to, to you know, make them believe that you may, you, it's an honest reporting we're doing, trying to get the information out. But at some point in time, it became a thing where they think it was like we against the world because the media can, go, can only do right, but in the government eyes, you do it wrong because you're covering something that embarrasses them. Mm. We're gonna get back to that, but uh, since we're talking about governments, um, in Nigeria, your government had time to prepare. Uh, so the Nigerian government tackled this in a completely different way from the Liberian. I know you have a presentation. Do you want to do that? Okay. Uh, it's up there. Thank you. What actually happened was that while Ebola held sway in these uh, three African countries. Nigerian government knows that 
they were in for trouble because of our porous borders and all that. So they had to take some proactive measures. They were learning lessons from what was happening from uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and uh, Guinea. So they had to prepare. There were some proactive measures put in place. And one of those proactive measures was uh, kind of issuing red alert, you know, warning citizens that Ebola was within a region and could enter into the country at any time. So that everybody has to be careful where you travel to and what you do. This was followed with massive awareness campaign right from the federal level to the uh, hinterland. So by the time Ebola finally came into the country a few months later, everybody, both literate and non-literate alike, were already aware of the dangers of Ebola outbreak. So that was what actually happened, the way they handled it. Uh, after that, uh, this thing, after three months, they issued that alert. Mm. Patrick Sawyer entered Died. into the country, just like he rightly said. Mm. And, uh, when he entered into the country, in fact, we knew that there was trouble. But there were some ways that they handled it, you know, that really helped to save the situation. Media played a very fantastic role. That is what we call media onslaught. They were really on top of the game. They were reporting everywhere, you know, every time what was happening, giving updates and all that. Then the, the, another thing that helped us in tackling it was uh, effective... Uh, uh, tracking technique, co-passengers yeah. of Patrick Sawyer, they were all traced using immigration records. Mm -hmm. You know, they traced them, get them to be quarantined. They were effectively quarantined, you know, monitored. You know, then the ones who were coming up with symptoms, they were given treatment and all that. Then uh, they, would have a, they had to decontaminate some of the places, you know, where the Ebola patients were traced to like the ECOWAS uh, office, mm -hmm. where they packed the vehicle that brought uh, uh, Sawyer from, took Sawyer from the airport mm -hmm. to the hospital where he finally just, died. Just one question. Um, okay. You said that the media played a, a role in this. Yeah. How was it to work during those weeks when you sort of... Okay, you, how it worked? The yeah, how did you work with it as media? Oh, oh okay. Yeah, I was monitoring these... Uh, uh, updates from other media houses. I had to make phone calls, you know, I had to now pull these facts together mm. that I've got from other media houses. I had to inter interview health authorities within my region to know what and what they are doing mm. to tackle Ebola. Paradventure, it enters into the, the state. I equally had to network with some WHO representative to get updates from the Ebola management centers, you know, mm. with that I had to come up with stories because I was the person in charge of health, so everybody was on me. There must be story on Ebola. You have to tell them updates. You have to tell them what is happening. Mm. You have to tell them, educate them how to live, what they need to do, or how they should live hygienically, preventive measures, and how they can manage it, mm. what they should do if they have any suspected case and all that. I guess in Nigeria as well, uh, I remember some of the coverage was quite sensational and there was quite a lot of rumours. Um, how did you sort of debunk, debunk the rumours in Nigeria? Okay. The, the, the rumour actually, you know, was because of the sensitisation, you know, everybody was panicking. I remember the one that was sent out that when you take salt solution and bath with salt solution, oh, you won't have Ebola and all that. And of mm. course, we are just flying left everywhere, all over the place. You know, some persons will call you in the midnight, oh, that just go and bath with hot, uh, hot water with sol uh, salt solution on it, then you have to drink it, you know, quite a lot of, you know. And at the end of the day, two persons died for drinking salt, just yeah. for the fear of Ebola. So the rumors and all that, you know, they tried to make people to be careful. Mm -hmm. Some started wearing hand gloves. Some that were used to maybe exposing their body started wearing long sleeves so that when they have to contact somebody's skin, maybe the sweat won't have to go in and all that. Yeah. So schools were equally shut down for a while. Yeah. Are you at DJ yeah, slides? I, I can see it from here. Okay. 
because we want to get to, to the challenges again. Was oh, the government okay. forthcoming in, in Nigeria with information? With information, getting to... Yeah, was it easy to get information from the government? No, it was not really easy. Especially those authorities that were involved. You mm -hmm. call so many of them, they want you to, they want to take permission from the highest authority before they will speak to you and mm. all that. But you need to come up with your story. You need to know what is happening within your region. This, you have to still network with other states to know what is happening. Mm. So some of them were really difficult to get to, to uh, hold on to. You book an appointment, before you know it, the person will call you, it's like, I'm very busy now. You call the person again, the person will not want to answer you. Some yeah. of them, you know, they will tell you, uh, okay, you call me back, I will call you, you call, they won't pick the calls. So that is that. So they weren't really forthcoming with they, any information? No, they were, some they? of them were not forthcoming. No. Some of them were not forthcoming. But uh, in, in, in the end, uh, Nigeria beat sort of Ebola in a matter of weeks. Yeah. Uh, you had not they that had, many persons yes, died. Yes, there were 19 cases. Yeah. 19 persons were infected. But 12, you know, survived it, mm. but uh, seven died. That was when it became obvious. Those seven that died, you know, when the thing came, everybody was panicking. Mm. Nigeria went running for Ebola treatment drug from yeah. US, but fortunately they didn't get it. Yes. They gave them uh, another alternate, alternative of a Dano, Silver, mm. you know, and other, but WHO didn't approve of it. So no. that was when they now resorted to treating the symptoms. Mm. And that, you know, worked perfectly. At the end of the day, those patients that went through this uh, uh, treatment of symptoms, they mm. tested them and they discovered that they have all been cleared of uh, the Ebola yeah. uh, symptoms. Which brings us to the next one. Ashuka uh, Mukpo, as we saw in the video, you arrived in Monrovia in September. Uh, to work as a freelancer. Could you just talk us through what you experienced? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so September was probably one of the worst months. I think August and September, statistically, were when the most deaths happened. Um, I had lived in Liberia for about two years prior, and I left in May, got back at the beginning of September, and it was just a dramatic change. But also, I think, like what Rodney said with the way that it looked on people's TV screens versus the experience in the country is, was really interesting for me. You could have gone most places in Monrovia or across the country and you wouldn't have even known that there was an outbreak happening. You would have seen maybe an ambulance screaming by and traffic pulling over or one of the body disposal teams and you might have known that something was going on, but you actually had to go to the treatment centers and to the infected neighborhoods just to see how bad things were. But if you went to those areas, it was dramatic. And you know, for someone who's not a traditional conflict correspondent or hasn't been around those kind of things, I found it to be quite intense. Um, the first day that I got there, that was where a fair amount of that footage that you guys saw came from so that immediately it just became apparent to me that there was not enough resources, there was not enough of control over this, and the mood in the country was very fear, fearful and very uncertain. I think the second week in September, the Center for Disease Control came out and made these predictions that there could be as many as 500,000 cases in Liberia alone, cumulatively. And given that Liberia only has four million people, that would have been you know, something that would have dramatically changed Liberian society permanently. So it was just basically nobody knew what was happening. And it was very frightening. And there was a lot of human suffering that, that we were seeing. Um, as far as the media situation, you know, it's interesting. Like the flights would leave packed full of aid workers who were being evacuated by their respective charities probably at moments that they were the most needed for them to stay, um, but there was security concerns, relatively, you know, <laughs> understandable security concerns. And those planes would then bring journalists back. So you had this real influx of journalists coming into Liberia from foreign countries. And, you know, it was interesting as a freelancer for the two years prior to that, I would pitch stories that I thought were important, you know, whether they had to do with natural resources or, 
corruption or things that I think are important for the future of Liberia and that connect to some other dynamics within West Africa. And editors typically get back to you and they're just not interested, you know. But as soon as the Ebola crisis happened, because it provoked so much fear and terror in Western countries, it became just this circus. So you had people from pretty much every major news outlet came. And it was a, a bit of a mixed bag. You know, I think you saw some organizations that were really just concerned with the sensationalism. They wanted to get the most dramatic footage and the most, uh, you know, horrible sights and, and the gotcha kind of like who's responsible for this stuff. And then there were some journalists that were much more interested in the context and getting a little bit deeper into, you know, the political situation and how this was affecting people's social lives and why it gotten as bad as it was in the first place. And I've, I've mentioned this to you a couple of times, but I think that the New York Times did excellent coverage. And I would say that a major reason for that is that they really worked with local journalists. So they worked with Front Page Africa and a friend of ours as well, another freelancer who's named Claire McDougall, really kind of showed them around the country and gave them a pretty good framework to understand what was happening. And I think the more that the international correspondents were willing to listen to the local journalists and really partner with them instead of just using them as drivers and fixers and saying, you know, this is what we want to do and we just want you to get us to point A to point B, that those were the organizations that did the best work and the ones that did the worst work were the people that had the story in mind before they got there. So there's this infamous 60 Minutes piece that Laura Logan came in from... Uh, South Africa to do, and she did an entire documentary on the Ebola crisis where there was not one interview with an actual Liberian. So this whole piece was just Western medical responders and, and uh, you know, West people who are, who are part of the international response. And not only was that kind of irresponsible, poor journalism, it wasn't the real story, it wasn't what was happening. So that, you know, just, I don't want to talk too much, but just to kind of bring up this point that there were some folks that I think knew what they wanted to cover before they got there. So they had their narratives already in mind. And a major narrative was that the international responders were heroes and the librarians were these victims that needed rescuing. And there's no doubt that you needed to deploy international resources. It was plainly apparent that there wasn't enough treatment centers, there wasn't enough testing facilities. But you know, I think if you went to an American audience or a European audience and you said, what do you picture when you hear the word Ebola doctor? Most people, they're gonna think of an aid worker. You know, somebody who's white, European trained, works for MSF or the IMC or something like that. But actually on the ground in Liberia, the doctors that had the highest survival rates and were the most successful and the most considerate towards their patients were almost uniformly the African doctors. So they had Ugandans that came in and worked with the World Health Organization. You had librarians like Jay Saka Moses and Jerry Brown. And, uh, you know, I think it was, it was interesting that they didn't always get the kind of coverage and attention that maybe they deserve. In fact, they definitely did deserve. And just a little anecdote that I'll end with is looking at Doctors Without Borders. I think everybody who came to cover from the outside was like, look, this charity is, they're the heroes of this story. And, there's no question that MSF was out in front of the outbreak before it happened. Uh, you know, they raised the international alarm in a way that needed to be raised when the World Health Organization wasn't doing a good enough job of, uh, you know, getting the political wheels moving to deploy resources. But MSF's actual treatment of patients, I think, was the worst of all the organizations that were there. And some people have criticized them for this. Paul Farmer came out and said a few things. And I don't mean this to be saying MSF is bad. They did remarkable work, they took incredible risks. But at one point in September, so that month, uh, you probably didn't notice it, but there was footage of a sign that got put up that said, for reasons of staff safety, we can't insert IV lines. Now, somebody who's gone through the experience of having Ebola, that's how, what you need to do to save someone's life. You actually, the way the virus kills is you get dehydrated and IVs are absolutely crucial in keeping people alive. And I think that the, you know, um, 
heavy application of intravenous fluids is what was responsible for the high survival rates that we saw in Western countries. In America, it was 90% survival. The only one person who died was librarian. Now, MSF made a conscious decision that because they were concerned that their staff members might prick themselves while they were inserting IVs. And, you know, it's a calculation that I think they felt like they had to make as a medical organization that they wanted to protect their staff. And it's debatable whether that was the right decision or not. I personally don't think it was the right decision. And the World Health Organization never did that. Neither did the Liberian, um, uh, Liberian hospitals. But I, you know, the freelancers and I think some of the local journalists as well, you know, we really noticed this, that this was the reputation among people who knew what was happening in the various treatment centers, that if you got sick, don't go to MSF. And we felt like there was some obligation to raise the profile of that so that, um, you know, maybe MSF could be pushed to reinstate their IV program, because at that point we didn't know that it was only going to be suspended for a month. It seemed like it could just be indefinite, and they were getting the vast majority of patients. But what I saw personally in working with journalists who came in from outside the country is that they weren't interested in that story. Yeah. And that I think the problem was that a lot of them knew what they wanted to cover, and they had their ideas in mind, and they sort of came with this like list of, okay, we're gonna go here and do this, and here and do this, and here and do this. And you know, I found that kind of, you know, they, it wasn't the most responsible or, or the most insightful way to cover the crisis because actually you couldn't know what was really happening until you spent a little bit of time on the ground and came to understand what was going on. And, uh, you know, again, that the best thing that you could have done in that situation is really work with local journalists, get the information from them, and then follow up on that by giving them credit. You know, I think yeah. Front Page Africa actually broke stories. That was the, Rodney's newspaper was the first to report that there was a case decline in I think the beginning of October is right. when Wade wrote that, right. Right? right? So this was, you know, now it seems like in retrospect, of course, that, you know, cases were going to drop. But nobody at the time thought that in October we were going to see a case decline. People thought that through December it was going to shoot up until you got to a point that it was just crazy. And, um, you know, one of the first people to really notice that things were not, that something was happening on the ground that was changing the dynamic was local journalists because they'd been following it and watching it for so long. So I think, you know, the rest of the media took a little longer for them to pick it up, but I just think it's a testament to how well local journalists performed in, in this crisis and how much of an important role they played. And like Rodney said as well, uh, reporters were taking risks as well. You were taking risks. <laughs> we have to talk about this. Um, <laughs> because in early October, you got sick. So tell us what happened. <laughs> well, I don't know what happened. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Um, I actually thought that I was being safe. You know, we had these discussions of what rules you'd have to follow to keep yourself from getting sick. Don't go too close to an infected patient. Don't go into the house of somebody who's sick. Stay out of the treatment units and, and those kind of things. And I followed those rules pretty strictly. And there was other journalists that went into these treatment units with cameras and, you know, microphones and things like that. And, you know, it's one of those fluky things. I think probably that there was just some, somebody had touched a, a surface or maybe they pressed their hand in my car as they walked by and then I, I went and touched it. But there was such a fear kind of thing that was happening. I'm not sure if you felt this way too, Rodney, but it was like for that whole month, if you sneezed, right. you know, or like if you felt kind of a little bit tired or run down or if you had a small headache, oh my God, I have Ebola, you know, <laughs> I'm about to have to get into treatment. So we would take our temperature twice a day. And that day I was working with NBC, I started to feel run down and I felt a little more run down than I should have. You know, I'd worked a long couple of days, but I felt like, okay, I need to take my temperature. And, I did, and my temperature was high enough that I was pretty convinced right off the bat that, that I was sick. So I was in a treatment unit, actually MSF, which is uh, another kind of funny story, because when I first got to MSF and got a positive result, I said, I don't want to be here. You've got to take me to one of the other units. Um, <laughs> But they promised to IV me, which is, you know, that, that's a, an, an interesting kind of point, right? It's like when a Western journalist came in and said, I'm not going to stay here unless you put an IV in, in me, 
I think they were worried about the PR fallout that would have happened if the first thing would have been I left. So they agreed to that once I needed it, put an IV in, and they did, you know, I think two or three days into it. But I was there for four days. Um, it was a very, very rough situation there. Um, you know, you just see people dying on a daily basis. There was no blankets, there was no pillows, which I'm still shocked by. You know, these are just really basic things that you can make somebody comfortable with. And I really got the sense that that facility was not there to keep people alive. It was there to isolate people who are sick so that you could keep the outbreak from getting uh, bigger. And I think I saw a doctor for like five minutes a day and nurses would come in and give me medication. And you know, being an American is not without its privileges. <laughs> so they sent a jet, scooped me into it and put me in a hospital in Nebraska. And I was there for two weeks completely different situation. They IV'd me immediately. They were giving me experimental drugs. I got a blood transfusion. I had a team of nurses watching over me on a day-to-day -day basis. So it was like the contrast between being in the Liberian facility and then being in the hospital in the U.S. It was pretty dramatic, but yeah, rough three but, weeks and here I am. <laughs> you said as well that you were getting special treatment inside mm -hmm. the MSF unit. Mm -hmm. What did you think about that? Well, it's, you know, when we say special treatment, what that really comes down to is getting an IV and not being in the same ward as the rest of the patients. So yeah, there was definitely a level of attention put on me that was not put on librarian patients. And, you know, it's like, yeah, I feel a lot of conflicted emotions about that. You know, I know it's, it's not right. And, you know, particularly the fact that I got evacuated, whereas if one of Rodney's journalists had gotten sick, they would have just been thrown in that MSF unit and they would have had to ride it out there. But it's easy for me to look back on it now and think, you know, this, there was, the inequalities were real. And I felt that even at the time. But when you're in that situation, you, you know, I didn't have any part of me that was thinking, well, I should stay in this unit with the rest of the librarians because I'm in the same situation as them. I wanted that. I wanted to be evacuated, but I definitely became very conscious through my experience of, frankly, just how much privilege that Americans and Europeans have in working in countries like Liberia or, or really just across the world. There's a, an attention and a care and a pool of resources available to us that there's nothing special about me that I'm getting treated this way, and mm. one of Rodney's journalists wouldn't, but it's the world we live in. We talked uh, a bit about rumors and misinformation that was rife in Liberia and was rife in Nigeria as well. Um, I guess going back to US, it must have felt strange to read the papers, what they were reporting on Ebola. Mm. Uh, could you give us some examples of that? Yeah, I mean, the situation that I woke up into after I recovered in the United States was just insanity. I'm sure a lot of people were paying attention to how the Western media covered this. And it was just hysteria, you know. And all the focus was on Western survivors, Western journalists. And, um, you know, what was still happening in Liberia was serious in Sierra Leone and Guinea is that they still needed attention. They needed resources. And for a period of about two weeks, the coverage of what was happening in West Africa was almost non-existent. It was just all about... Uh, anybody who might have been in New York at the time, yeah, there was a doctor who went on a subway ride and went bowling before he, um, before he came down with the virus. Now, anybody who knew the science knew that there was almost zero risk that if he was not symptomatic that he would have infected people. But it turned into this circus, and I felt like I could see this dynamic of feeding the beast, you know, that a lot of media outlets that really had a responsibility at that point to kind of calm people down and get them to see clearly that what we needed to do is focus on West Africa. They were instead, get like, we're getting ratings here. You know, let's, let's keep running with the story. Let's scare people because we're going to get them to watch these, you know, there was like a 30-minute special at one point that these people were having like a debate about whether or not Ebola could transmit in dogs and whether... Western people who got it and had dogs should have their dogs killed. <laughs> You're thinking, we're, we're focusing on this, like this is the wrong, the wrong thing. And then also there was a level of like, oh, you know, you're so brave and you're so heroic. And, and it's like, 
I, I just felt like there was a lot of misplaced attention towards us. And it was, I was very, very uncomfortable with it. Yeah. yeah. I think we, we need some time for, for questions. Uh, if you could come with a microphone for me. Um, are there any questions? Uh, let's see, we have three questions over in this corner. I'll put your hands again so you can see. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Um, I'm just actually wondering if there were any consistent, if there was any consistent coverage about, like, about the trauma that patients, survivors, families of survivors, families of victims who, have ad who had died, um, if there was any sort of like, I was disappointed at least in what I saw, that there wasn't very much coverage. And I feel like that's still a story, probably. I imagine that it is. Um, and I don't know, I was in West Africa filming and I remember feeling like very uncomfortable and not really knowing how to approach that situation. And, and, and also just like, then there's that question of like, patient, like privacy, and choosing whether or not to show patients and, and all of that and like at which point is it like for the greater good to do that and at which point is it not? Um, I don't know, I guess I'm just like really interested in the idea of like trauma in these health crises and like how it's not really included in a lot mm. of the coverage. Mm. Yeah. That's a question for me. I think there were a couple of times where, a few times where um, you saw anguish, but it happened when there was an international connection. When Eric Duncan went to America with the virus, all of a sudden the next day, journalists descended on his home, the place he used to live, where the girl who died, unless he lived. So they interviewed the, the family, the kids in the area, and you can see the emotion on their faces, because they all, at that point, were suspect of having Ebola because the girl, his girlfriend or his friend died from Ebola, so there was a lot of anguish. But in terms of access to facilities where people were on the beds, very few people had access. Um, uh, the Laura girl from 60 Minutes, she was allowed because of, she interviewed American troops, American medical doctors, who were stationed in Liberia, so they allowed her to go and see the where they were working. But others didn't have that access to go and see facilities where people were actually being taken treatment. So it was a matter of access, and when the government finally put out this statement saying you cannot go to these places, it actually stopped people from going to seeing them patients on the bed, and they did cite those rules that patient, confident, patient uh, information access and all that thing was cited as a reason why they can't allow people to, to actually go and see them. But the way Liberia was set up is that you saw the video, people were actually lying down in front of these places so you could see them in the condition they were in. So to tell the story without even having to ask for information or access to get to them. So it was just a matter of saying, I remember one morning um, there was a report that people were a lot of people were st standing in front of this El facility where they were trying to get in the, behind the fence to get treated. And people who live in the neighborhoods got up in the morning and saw Ebola suspected patients on their porches, just walking like zombies, you know, like craving for help because there was no space in the fence. So I remember reading an article about how it was like heaven and hell because behind the walls of El facility, you had MSF who had all the nice facilities, the lighting, the generator, the best medical supplies. And then down the street, there was a librarian doctor, Dr. Brown, who had literally nothing. And he was curing more people than MSF. But he wasn't getting coverage. It wasn't until the data came out later that Time Magazine named him one of their people of the year because he did a lot of work you know, with people. And he, because he was not getting the media coverage, you could go to him. A lot of the people in Washington Post and New York Times that came through us, we took them to him because at the time he was the one who was telling you, I have this patient, had that patient. And 
the thing that didn't get covered a lot was that Amazon actually wanted him to share data with them, and he refused. He said, no, I'm going to keep my own data, because he was afraid that they were going to put his data, his success rate, with their rates, and say they put him out more um, success cases. Mm -hmm. So he kept his data by himself, and after everything was done, it turns out he had more, he had cured more people from Ebola than the international doctors. Just to kind of follow up on that really briefly, um, the trauma issue I think is, is really important right now. And you know, one of the sort of corollary things about being an Ebola survivor is that I've met and networked with a lot of other survivors every time I've been back in Liberia. And when the, what they call post-Ebola syndrome conversation gets brought up, what people tend to focus on is the physical stuff. So joint pains, you know, memory loss, uh, eye problems, these kind of things. But what I've seen in talking to survivors is that the trauma and you know, the sort of recurrent PTSD and just emotional stuff that they've been through, I think is much more debilitating than the physical stuff. And it's being essentially totally unaddressed. And I think, you know, you could probably discuss what Liberian culture sees, how it sees trauma and how traditionally it's treated. But for a lot of these people, they lost 25 members of their family, even if you lose three members of your family. Like for me, I got out and it was a rough time, but my family was there, you know, and they're supporting me, they're, they're there. If I had gone through that and lost half of my family, that's not something you get over in a year. You need clinical support for something like that. There has to be some mechanism. And it's not really happening because people look at it like, well, the outbreak's over, let's move on. And I think a lot of these folks are sort of falling through the cracks. And you can see them having a hard time adjusting. I've talked, you remember the guy Dominic from the documentary with the kid? He lost, I think, over 20 members of his family. And he calls me and talks to me sometimes. And it's clear that he is struggling with PTSD. And there's just no resources for him. Um, I can't remember what the second part of your question was. Anyway. I think we'll take yeah. the, there's two more questions over there. Uh, hi, my name is Eva. Um, I work for Internews and I just finished um, a two year program basically training Kenyan journalists in how to cover health systems um, through investigative journalism. So sort of in reaction to the HIV epidemic, how can local journalists monitor how aid is being spent to improve the quality of healthcare for citizens. And from what I've heard from you guys, actually investigative journalism has kind of been absent from the discussion. And I wanted to know, is this a natural moment for Liberian journalists, and Nigerian journalists to transfer more from just covering the crisis to now taking a more active role in investigative journalism and monitoring the funding coming in? Because I mean, we know the crisis was so bad because of the terrible health infrastructure. It's not going to be Western audiences monitoring whether that system is improved. It's going to be the population. And citizens need the information and they need the monitoring from the journalists to evaluate whether or not something like this is going to happen again. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is that happening? Is more investigative journalism about health systems as all this aid flows in? Is it happening? And what support do you need? What kind of training support? Um, what kind of financial support is needed to ensure that there's regular quality content about the recovery process and the strengthening of the health infrastructure system? Yeah, um, as far back as uh, before we even were declared Ebola free, we've been doing a lot of investigative stories about funding. In fact, at the height of Ebola, we did an article about the first one, uh, one million dollars that was $5 million was spent by the government. That's the money they gave to the Ebola crisis. And we managed to ask the government how was this money spent. The president said, she made a speech, and she said, because we're in crisis, there was no time to do check and balance, to be transparent. And we took her statement to mean that she was giving excuses for those who were stolen, allegedly stolen aid money. Before Ebola, Liberia had no ambulance. When Ebola came, after we appealed for help, Japanese gave ambulances, Chinese gave ambulances, Americans gave ambulances, 
local NGOs gave ambulances. We pretty much had about maybe close to 80, 100 ambulances. We've been doing articles the last few days and weeks and months about now that Ebola is over, those ambulances are being used now as transportation for government workers. They use them to ride, um, to take people from one place to the point for, for, for money. So we've been taking pictures in the traffic saying this month these ambulances were given for goodwill, now they're being used for transportation. Um, the aid money that came in, USAID, I think they funded something through IREX to do an investigation about how the, the aid money from their country was spent in Liberia, and they found a lot of flaws in how they used the money. So the, <coughs> a lot of mismanagement took place. And when you write about these articles, the first thing they tell you, you're not patriotic. You're anti-government. And that's my daily bread. That's why I got in trouble. I've been to jail twice because of my outspoken nature and my paper's credibility. So they, they brand you as an anti-government, as a non-patriot when you write stories like these. But we still do them. And we're still investigating them. In fact, when we questioned the $5 million that the government put in, there was not one mention in $5 million of buying one ambulance from that money. Your own money, your country's own budget, put $5 million, and you didn't buy one ambulance. If you look at the listing of the things that they put on the list to buy from that money, security, took about $2 million. Security for what? <laughs> they put things like buying water. And what they did was that they had committees. So they would put like, we bought $20,000 worth of water. And we managed to balance what they put there and what the Indian community or the Lebanese community gave to Ebola. The same amount of donation items were mentioned as purchase items hmm. on the listing. So we're doing, we're doing investigate these things. But the, our frustration has been that the international media hasn't been able to push uh, to kind of prop us up with this coverage. The more concern was about when the people were dying, tragedy, they were all over it. But now that these things are coming up, hands off. So you left in the war zone by yourself, a local reporter reporting about these things and being branded as non-patriot. You know, so it's a tricky balance, but we still do it. We don't have the funding that they have, like the Western media have, but we still cover these things because people need to know what's happening. And we take the risk and we do it. And we're still doing it. I think we're running a bit over time, but we have one more question over there. Be before I ask my question, I just wanted to comment on Eva's uh, take. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I, th I think I mentioned it already at another session, but it's good. Uh, that you know that even after uh, the peak of the, the Ebola, there were some journalists in Africa continuing to report. And I myself coordinated a uh, cross-border investigation, actually, Rodney's paper was part of that uh, partnership where we had eight, news, um, eight newspapers in eight countries and a group of freelance journalists in other countries. And we did some in-depth work on the health system because, as, as you, you rightly put it, it's, it was not, my take before starting that was Ebola was not just uh, counting the number of dead people and showing the dramatic footage, but it was first and foremost a governance issue. I think it was really a governance issue. Uh, the health system in West Africa needed to be fixed. Maybe Ebola helped uh, ring the bell so that people knew that there was something wrong. So that was just a comment. And actually, for those who are following me on Twitter, you, I've, I've, I've sent the space where all the stories generated have been ag aggregated, so you, 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 you can find it there. Now my question, I just wanted the gentleman, sorry I missed your name, to, to clarify the role you're giving to uh, MSF. Are you saying they were really isolating people just to die, and that in your case you were really privileged in your treatment? Because it seems that's what I heard. Can you please clarify? Thank you. Yikes, I don't want to put that across about them. <laughs> Look, I think, uh, and I was talking with some people about this last night, just because somebody's doing good work, and you know, maybe even in some sense we want to use the word hero, 
It doesn't mean that they escape accountability for things that they could do better. So I don't think that MSF was doing things bad. I don't think that, you know, that this is some institution that needs to be brought down through in-depth reporting, but I think that they made decisions in how they treated patients in Africa that I don't think that they could have made those same decisions if they had treated Ebola patients in Switzerland or in France. If you had had a large unit that suspended the critical uh, medical intervention needed to save lives from people in Europe or America, there would have been a massive outcry. They wouldn't have been able to do it. They would have had to, to change. So I don't, I don't want to say that I think MSF was not concerned with saving lives because I know people who work for that organization. I know people who are working during the crisis and they wanted to see their patients survive. Their African staff, their Liberian staff, they, they talk about it when they lost patients as if it was family members. But I think that the purpose of their unit was overall, it was constructed with the idea in mind of stopping the outbreak by isolating people. And if you could save their lives, then that was good too, but that I would think was a secondary priority. Okay, I think we're running over time and um, I see there's some people there that they're gonna do the rigging here, so we actually need to leave the premises. Uh, but give our panelists a big hand. And I'm sure they will be around for more questions if you have anyone.